Genesis chapter 36. We are still stalking Esau. Although today we're not really going to talk about, e uh, I'm sorry, we're still stalking Jacob, but today we're going to talk about Esau. And we're going to do the, we're going to read the first eight verses there in Psalm, or <clears throat> Genesis chapter 36. Genesis chapter 36, verses 1 through 8. And uh, this will be uh, what I'm going to call the backslider's blessing. The backslider's blessing blessing. So Genesis chapter 36 verses 1 through 8. Let's just go ahead and read those and then I'll uh, open this in a word of prayer. Now these are the generations of Esau who is Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholabama the daughter of Ana the daughter of Zeboyan, Zebion, the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabayath, and Ada bare unto Esau Eliphaz, and Bashamath bare Reuel, and Aholabamah bare Jeush, and Jaalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives, and his sons, and his daughters, and all the persons of his house, and his cattle, and all his beasts, and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan, and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than they might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. So a backslider's blessing. What is backsliding? What is a backslider? Well, the idea in the Old Testament, the word that's translated to backslide, means to deviate or to be disloyal. The word translated backslide also means to draw back, to shrink back, or to recoil. A beautiful word picture of this condition is given to us in Hosea's prophecy. Uh, where he's in chapter 4 of that prophecy, he says, Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. So backsliding is always used for the believer who's gone back on their confession and redeemed condition. Backsliding is always used for the believer who has gone back on their confession and redeemed condition. It is never used for the lost. You never, we never talk about a lost man being a, black, a backslider. The lost man, whether he is engaging, fully engaging in sin, or whether he's trying to, at the moment, live a religious life and trying to follow some of the ideas and tenets and laws and commandments and precepts of the Lord, or, like I said, or he's living in his lost state, it doesn't matter, he's lost. You know, dead in and transgressions and sins means dead in transgressions and sins, whether he's fully engaged in his lostness or whether he's trying to be religious, still dead. So there's no backsliding. He's not backing away from anything. Backsliding is only for those who are in covenant with God. It always has been, always will be that idea. And as I said, it's a beautiful word picture there in Hosea. Uh, and I've told you this story before. I remember when I was a young man, Denise and I were just married, and I had a job, and in this particular job, I had a route, and I went to several different companies and serviced the companies that I, you know, drove to. One of the places that I went to was um, Melwood Packing, and they, they made bacon, and they made all kinds of pork products, and they had a great big slaughterhouse on Melwood Avenue there in Louisville, Kentucky. It's no longer there, but it uh, once was there. And I, they were one of my clients, and they said, hey, why don't you come in early one day, and we'll give you a, uh, we'll give you a tour of the slaughterhouse, of the slaughter for, floor. I said, okay, that'd be fine. Never having been on a slaughter floor like that before, I thought this would be interesting. And the first thing they take you to is the chute where the, where the uh, pigs come down. You know, they have a, a the... the 
semis back up into this pen. They offload the pigs into the pen, and then they have a guy in the pen who drives them up a ramp, and then they go up a ramp and then down the ramp into the slaughter floor. And as they're coming into the slaughter floor, they realize what's about to happen. I guess they smell it. I don't know. But they have a sense of what's about to happen. And they're, and they're doing this. They're, they're doing this with their feet, but they can't back up because the, the ramp is slick. And so they're trying to, to back their way out, and they can't do it. And they keep, the more they do this, the, the quicker they come down that ramp. And then there's a fellow down at the end of the ramp to take care of the rest. That's backsliding. You know, pushing away from where I'm headed. The Christian doing this is not a good is not a good view. It's not a good thing. So backsliding is one of those things that we I just we need to talk about. We have it right here before us in uh, in chapter 36, and it's a very appropriate designation for Esau. Esau was a backslider. He's the oldest son of Isaac, even though he enjoyed the blessing of living in the covenant keeper's home, yet he despised his birthright. How's that? It's because he's a backslider. He saw firsthand the way the Lord God kept his father and blessed him. If it was evident to Abimelech, one of the Philistine kings, who came to Isaac and said, we certainly saw that the Lord was with thee, and we said, let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant. They saw how God had blessed Isaac, and so God had he'd increased him in his crops, he'd increased him in his herds, he increased him in his people, in his money, in all of his house, and everyone saw it. But apparently, the oldest boy didn't notice it was certainly in front of him every day, and yet somehow he misses it. Well, I want to talk about backsliding from the perspective of Esau today. First of all, you notice there in verse 1, it says, Now these are the generations of Esau. Who is Edom? The chapter begins like that, and it ends like that. The, Moses wants us to know that Esau and Edom are the same thing. Because he's writing for a he's writing for a, a generation that's you know later on and for a generation that'll be even later than that for us and so he says Esau became Edom we have it there in verse one we have it again there in verse forty three at the very end of the chapter the last phrase he is Esau the father of the Edomites so we know we have this identification we understand who he is. But I want to focus on this idea of his backsliding here. And notice the very first thing there in verse 2. It says, Esau took wives of the daughters of Canaan. Now Esau, Esau ignored his birthright and joined himself to idol worshipers. Abraham didn't want that for his son Isaac, so he sent off and got Rebekah. Isaac didn't want that for his son Jacob, so he sent him off to get Rachel. Of course, he didn't know Rachel and Abraham didn't know Rebekah, but he didn't want the daughters of the idol worshipers to be his daughters-in-law and to have the children that would carry on the covenant because he didn't want to break that line of worship. And so he didn't want any admixture of idolatry in, in his home with the, um, with the worship of the Lord God. But Esau ignored that. Remember, he's pushing back. He, he says, oh, that's not for me. That's not for me. Look at all these pretty women here. And he looks around and he sees the daughters of Canaan. In uh, chapter 26 of the book of Genesis, it says, Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Barry the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were of a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. A grief of mind. Why is that? Because he had ignored, I'm sure, his father's instructions he had ignored his mother's pleadings and had taken to him women who were of the idol-worshipping Hittites and Hivites there in the land. Notice uh, going forward there in verse 2, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholabama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zebon, Z I'm not going to get that right, Zibion, the Hivite. So you'll notice that... Uh, 
who is it? Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. Hivite, that's, the, that's who lived in Shechem. That's who his boys destroyed. Remember that? We just went over that not too long ago. His boy des- destroyed the entire city of Shechem and was populated by Hivites. Well, not in Esau's house. He invites one in to be his wife. Genesis chapter 27. Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Why was she grieved? She says there, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. Because Esau had taken these women, and can you imagine the conflict in that house? But you see, Esau, it's okay, right? Because Esau's making his own rules. He's doing his own thing. He's ignoring his father's instructions. He's ignoring his mother's pleadings. And he's going to do his own thing, his own way. And how's it going to turn out for him? Is it, surely it's not going to dilute the worship of God in his house. (laughs) Verse 3. And Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter. This is verse 3 in our 36th chapter. Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. Nebaioth. So, in Genesis chapter 28, when he sends Jacob off to uh, take a wife from Pandanaram, in Genesis 28, it says, Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father... Then went to Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth, to be his wife. So uh, apparently Esau wakes up a little bit and decides, oh, well, maybe I should do something like this too. I won't take from the uh, daughters of the land. I'll take from Ishmael. And Ishmael, of course, is the brother to uh, Abraham. And this is my great uncle, and he's got daughters, and I'll take one from there, and that'll make Dad happy. Nope. Didn't make Dad happy. And how come all of a sudden, when he's, in, when he's seeing all this grief around him because he's lost the blessing, he's lost the birthright, he's, Jacob has gone into Pandanarim to get a wife, and all of a sudden he decides, oh, well, maybe I can do that and make Dad happy. You see, the backslider only thinks of his own happiness... In those moments. And so now he has three wives. So I think this is a good opportunity to talk about the issue of multiple wives in the in the scriptures. And let me just lay down a principle for you. No warrant exists in the Bible for a man to take more than one wife at a time. No principle exists in the Bible for one woman to take more than one man as a husband at a time. In the beginning, God set down a standard for marriage by arranging the first wedding in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. And that gives us the parameters for marriage. One man, one woman. Two becoming one. They become one flesh. How many ribs did the Lord take from Adam? One. How many women did he make from that rib? One. Who did God join together? One man and one woman. That is his principle. One man and one woman for life. Now Jesus completes this doctrine of marriage in Matthew chapter 19. The Pharisees come to him and they want to talk to him about divorce. And I'm not going to go into divorce. That's a different subject. It's not really different, but it's, I won't go into it at this moment. And he gives us the final stamp on God's plan for marriage. And basically what Jesus does is he takes Genesis chapter 2 and he just brings it forward into the moment and says, this is what the Lord said. He made them male and female. He, made, he put them together so that they could be one flesh. That's God's plan. It is ordered for us in Genesis through the action of God, it is explained to us by the Savior in Matthew chapter 19 and finishes off the whole idea of marriage. So, whenever you see multiple marriages in the Bible, you know this is not God's way. It's not his good plan for men. 
So why did the patriarchs and other men have multiple wives? Well, just as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, it's because of the hardness of the heart. Just as a hard heart can lead to divorce, so a lustful, greedy heart can lead to multiple wives. But it was not so since the foundation of the world. God had a plan, one man, one woman. And we could ask the question, why do some of the patriarchs have only one wife? Job had only one wife. Isaac had only one wife. Noah had only one wife. Isaiah had only one wife. Adam had only one wife, etc. Why do we always take the exception to be the rule? We look at the multiple wives that some of the patriarchs had and some of the others had in the Bible, and we say, well, well, God must be okay with it. No, he's not. He's not at all okay with it because he's given us the standard, Genesis and in Matthew. And so when we look at the Bible and we see men with multiple wives, we know it's not right. Do we want to say that it's okay for Solomon to have thousands of wives? Is that okay? No, of course not. Everyone who reads Solomon's story and we see all the multiple wives and concubines that he has, we say to ourselves, that's ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. But yet we have men in the Bible who have one, two, three, seven, twelve, and we're like, well, it must be okay with God. It's not okay. It's not okay. It's because of the hardness of the human heart that these things have happened. It rises up before us in this instance as well because Esau, he doesn't care. I'm sure Isaac and Rebekah told him, one woman, one man, that's it. I'm sure they said that because it's God's way. But yet Esau decided, well, he's going to do things his own way. Why? Because Esau is pushing back. He's, he's backsliding. He's pushing away from the things of God. Yeah, why do we always make the exception to be the rule? Well, it's generally because we want the exception to be the rule. And it's because the hardness of our hearts dictates such things. Look at verse 4 here in 36, chapter 36. A little bit more about Esau's backsliding. Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz. This, there in verse 4. Later on in the chapter, in verses 11 and 12, we have a little more description there. Uh, the sons of Eliphaz, these were now Esau's grandchildren, Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatim, Kenaz. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz, Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Now some of these names are recognizable to us as we think about the biblical record. And one that should just jump off the page at us is Amalek. We know Amalek. He became a great nation and was one that attacked Israel when they came out of Egypt. You remember that? The first ones, they decided that they were going to attack Egypt or Israel while they're on the march before they got to the land. And Amalek became a curse and they became a problem for Israel the whole time. And so we have Amalek as a problem for Israel all the way up through the reign of David. And even later on in captivity, when Israel is in captivity, in Persian captivity, uh, in Esther's story, the main character there, the bad guy, whose name escapes me at the moment. It's not Mordecai. What's the other fellow? Haman. Haman is a son of Amalek. So the Amalekites are a problem for Israel from the time they leave Israel, from the time they leave Egypt until the time of Esther. They've been a problem. Saul, you'll recall, was told to destroy the Amalekites and he didn't do it. So Amalek was a plague to the people of God from the time of Moses until the days of Esther. Why is it that we have this kind of a man being born to Esau as a grandson? Esau's a backslider. What is this boy learning in his home? I don't know. Notice there in verse 4, Bashemath bare Reuel. And we have in verse 13, the sons of Reuel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, Mizah. These were the sons of Bashemath, Esau's wife. A great grandson of Esau was Jobab of Zerah. You'll notice that he's mentioned in verse 33. 
This possibly could be the Job of our Bible. The book of Job, written about a man named Job. Jobab is possibly that man. He would be an ancient of the Bible, a grandson of, of Esau. And here we have a good man, someone who followed the Lord. Verse 5. Aholibamah bear Jeush, Jaalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau which were born to him in the land of Canaan. The sons of Aholibamah, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zebian, Esau's wife, and she bare to Esau these men. Doesn't mention their grandchildren. Uh, in, let's see, yeah. And so these men, um, you notice throughout the chapter, we're told about their ducal titles, in four, in verses 14 through 19. We're told about the kings of Edom, who were kings long before Israel ever had a king, verses 31 through 39. There you'll find Jobab in that list. And they enjoyed privilege and power and a position on the world stage of their day. This is a blessing of the Lord for Esau and for his family. We have dukes mentioned. And so these dukes, of course, have their castles and their titles and their lands. And they're overseeing all things. And my goodness, all of a sudden, you have all of these men just rising up and becoming important. Why is that? Why do you have all of these men becoming kings? Long before Israel ever had a king. I mean, all this time we have dukes and kings mentioned of Esau's line. What's going on with Jacob? They're in Egypt, in slavery, in bondage. They have, no, there's no dukes and kings going on down there. Not at all. But no, the Lord, because of his mercy, is allowing these people to be blessed. Why is that? Because he wants Esau to stop backsliding. Not just daddy Esau, but all of Esau's line because what daddy taught all of these boys was it's okay to make your own rules. It's okay to live your own way. It's okay to do things outside of God's law and the parameters that he's built. And so all of these boys are learning those things, but God is blessing them in, a, in an effort to draw them back to himself. And then we come to Esau's blessing. Notice verse 6. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. When Jacob left home, Esau was married already, but not well. But notice that God gave him a company of persons who would become nations themselves. And it's, it's kind of beautiful and tender, really, what we read here in verse 6. God gave him sons and daughters and all the persons of his house. Look at all the Lord gave Esau. He was truly a rich man. If in nothing else, he's rich in family. Now, he didn't go about it right, but he could correct the thing. And he could teach them how to serve the Lord, but he doesn't do that. But the Lord has blessed him. And what a blessing is there in a home when you have this kind of a family structure? But what kind of a home is it? That's the question. What kind of a home is it where the father ignores his devotion? What can the children do? What can the children do if the father ignores his devotion? But the Lord had blessed him. Sons and daughters and persons. Look at all this. It's just a company of people, just like what Jacob said by the river. You know, I crossed this Jordan with just my staff, and now look at me. I'm two companies. Look at Esau. God had blessed him. The family wasn't his only wealth. Notice there in verse 6, he continues, his cattle, his beasts, his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan. The blessing of Isaac is seen here. Let me quote from Genesis chapter 27. Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew from hev of heaven from above. Well, here it is, the fatness of the earth. He surely has it, doesn't he? Look at that again. Cattle, all his cattle, all his beasts, all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan. Yes, even though the blessing was less than Jacob's, still notice it's so great. He has all of this stuff. And we're going to see that 
Jacob and Esau couldn't no long, Kate could no longer live close by because they were just too big for the country to handle. All his wives, children, people, beasts, substance is because of his father Isaac's blessing on him, and God was making sure to make that blessing happen in real time, in Esau's life. Did Esau, this is the question though, did Esau see that? Christian friend, do you see the hand of your heavenly father at work in your life to bless you? You say you're a Christian, but do you ever praise him for the little and the big things? Is there ever a song on your heart of praise to the God who has taken you from little to big? The backslider sometimes just doesn't see it. Even though God is at work keeping his promise, because remember, the backslider is still in Christ. They have a standing in Christ. And so God is blessing, trying to draw them away from the world of sin. Even though, you know, the the backslider's doing this, trying to get away from the promises of God, God is doing this, drawing them with blessings of goodness to draw them back to the Lord. And he went into a far country from the face of his brother, for their riches were more than they might dwell together. What a tender mercy for such a tenderless man. Their riches were more than they might dwell together. God has certainly blessed this boy. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Notice that it says right there in verse 7, the land where they were, the land wherein they were strangers. Strangers. Notice he's called a stranger. Moses telling us that the Lord still considered him a son of Isaac, a son of Abraham. God had promised the land of this family. All of Palestine was going to be theirs. He's a stranger in it, but it's his because he's a son of Isaac. And yet the land was before him, but he left it. He left it. This is what the backslider does. They leave the blessing that's secured for some promise somewhere else, and it might be better over there. But God has made a promise. The backslider always leaves the promise. Now, I think it says that the land couldn't bear them. It's because they lived in such close proximity. I promise you that land was big enough for him to have gone someplace else and been just as prosperous, and he could have stayed in the land, but he didn't. He cast his eyes over to Seir. And guess who lives in Seir? The Horites. And guess what Edom had to do or Esau had to do to take Mount Seir? He had to compromise with and he had to slaughter a bunch of the Horites. But of course, that was a part of Isaac's blessing too, wasn't it? That he would live by his sword. And so he sees Seir that it is that it is um, weak and he can take it and he's got enough people and he goes over there to have it for himself because it's not enough for him to have the blessing in the promised land. So he's going to have it for himself. Even though he wasn't the covenant bearer, he was still a son of Isaac and the land still would have provided for him, but he just could not stand to live in a place of promise. So in verse 8, it says, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. The end of Edom is pronounced against Esau by Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah writes this, But I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. That's Jeremiah 49.10. Esau is no more, ladies and gentlemen. Edomites are no more. Because eventually the backslider, if he does not repent, comes before the judgment seat of God. So how do, we, how do I conclude this? How do we apply this 36th chapter? Well, I've got a list of seven things here that I'm going to call how not to be a backslider. I think I'm going to write a book. How not to be a backslider. Esau's story, you know, 
That'll be how to be a backslider, how not to be a backslider will be the title, you know, colon, subtitle, Esau's story. So here's, here's how not to be a backslider. Number one, don't despise the things of God. Every backslider who's ever been, including Esau, despises the things of God. Number two, don't make up your own rules for living. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question about how to live your life, crack open your Bible and do a little study. Because I guarantee you that the Bible answers your question about how to live. It answers your question about money. It answers your question about life. It answers your question about home and family and everything else that you could possibly have a question about. The Bible will answer it. Do not tell me that you can't find it in your Bible. You've just not looked hard enough yet. And you've probably not prayed hard enough about it either. Because he has given to us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness. Don't make up your own rules for living, dear Christian friend. This is how not to be a backslider. Number three, don't rob your children of an ordered home life. I am certain that Esau allowed his backsliding to spill over into the hearts of his children because he just thought he was right. You know, I'm not going to do it God's way. I'm not going to live in God's place. I'm not going to be about the things of God. I'm not going to do it like my daddy did it. I'm going to do it my own way. And you know what? His babies are hearing all of that. And what do they want to be when they grow up? Just like daddy. And so they hear all that mess. And what do they do? They go off and do it just like daddy did it. But if you order your home life according to God's word, and you build an altar in the home, somewhere in the home, ladies and gentlemen, it will make wonderful things for your children. Four, don't envy those who have much of this world's goods. Esau's family, they were immediately wealthy, they were immediately powerful, they were immediately important in this world. Don't envy those who have this world's goods. Even though the pictures on the television and the sounds on the radios and all the stuff on the internet will tell you opposite. Having a lot of this world's good will never make you happy and will never fulfill you. Fifth, don't envy those who are influential and powerful. Esau's sons became dukes. They had castles. They became kings. They had it all long before Israel ever had any of that. And so when we look at people who have influence and power, we ask ourselves, well, why not me? Why not me? Well, you don't know what they gave up to have it. So don't envy it. God will give it to you when he's ready, or maybe he won't. That's up to him. Number six, do not overlook the mercies of God in your life. Do not overlook the mercies of God in your life. Esau was crashing and careening down the hill and is backsliding. And yet all the while God is being merciful to him and giving to him and blessing him because he's a son of Isaac. And yet Esau ignored it the whole time. He ignored all of it. Number seven, finally. Don't forget that you have a standing before the Lord because of Christ Jesus. Yes, you may be in a backslidden condition. Yes, you may be away from the Lord, but you have a standing in Christ Jesus. If you are in him, ladies and gentlemen, call on him, repent of that sin, turn back to God, and he will receive you right this moment. Right this moment. He is always ready to show mercy to the one who calls on him.